Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. The nation's station, Manx Radio. Hello and welcome to the latest look back at Talking Heads, public sector pension reforms, plans for Douglas Promenade, and changes to state pension arrangements were all up for discussion this week. Here's Stu Peters with more. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. At its sitting on the 15th of March, Tynwald approved a new agreement on state pensions with the United Kingdom. It provides that people who've reached state pension age on or after the 6th of April this year and who've paid or been credited with national insurance contributions in both the Isle of Man and the UK will be entitled to separate state pensions from the UK and from the Isle of Man Treasury. To discuss the full details of the new agreement and what it means for current pensioners, and the Manx Pensioners of the Future. I'm joined in the studio now by Treasury Minister Eddie Tier and Bill Henderson, MLC from Treasury. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Pastor Mice, Stu, and to our listeners. Good to see you. And uh, so uh, I was quite interested in this. Let's just have a look at this as it stands uh, right now. And my understanding is that if you've moved to the Isle of Man, and, and let's use me as an example, I moved here in 1997 with something like 40-odd years contributions to the UK system, I think. Well, 30-odd years contribution to the UK system. Moved here, and uh, I'd always thought I will, at some point, you know, after 20 years, get a, a Manx pension here and I presumed that the money that I paid in the UK was sort of shipped to the Isle of Man to pay my pension uh, liability here. Is Eddie Tier, is that the way that it's worked to now or am I simplifying it? No we didn't accept the liability we did get uh, a compensatory payment from the UK in respect of the portion of pensions which people who uh, were getting their pensions paid by the Isle of Man had actually earned and accrued in the UK. Okay. So, um, there was oh, and a, was that a reciprocal thing? So if people from the Isle of Man went to work in the UK, did we have to pay their pensions over there kind of thing? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a reciprocal thing. Um, every year, uh, Bill, Bill and the team um, sit down, they have a look at uh, how um, the payments work and there's a compensatory payment it might be a significant amount in our favour it might yeah. be a significant amount the other way okay. it depends on the number of people coming to the Isle of Man or leaving the Isle of Man And which way was it generally? Was it in our favour or was it in the UK's favour? Yeah. Bill? Uh, generally our favour I would say Stu Oh so, so we're, we, it's going to cost us money then doing it the new way? Uh, no it's not um, I'm looking at it from the point of view and how the books were balanced uh, yearly by the adjustments that were made um, and in that respect um, I think it was pretty much even Stevens as far as that goes we might have paid a little bit more one year or balanced up from the UK probably more so from their uh, side I would say going forward however uh, I suppose it's best to explain the situation that we're trying to achieve, Stu, and that's to achieve um, a building block to work from whereby the UK have decided that they're moving to single state pension. Their target figure was £155 a week um, and doing away with contracting out and so on. The administrative issues that caused us last year when that was coming through were immeasurable, to say the least. And also it gave us a chance to look at how we were doing things, how our own pension ideas were progressing. And so we decided to work with the UK and uh, produce a split pension system, if you like, rewrite the reciprocal arrangement as far as that piece goes, so that it enabled us to carry on on a base of stability and pay out our Manx pension side of the pension. And for folk who've come here with uh, joint working uh, pensions and uh, contributions from the UK, for them to receive what they're due from the UK as well. So it then also enabled us to be masters of our own destiny. Going forward, we're now on a platform we can carry on, and if needs be, we set our own rates for the future, we set our own pension and so on, if we want to. Uh, Minister, I mean, was this at our behest? Did we decide that we wanted to split away from the existing scheme or was this the UK that said, you know, we need to do this differently, boys? This was at our behest because uh, we wanted to develop a pension scheme which was suitable for the Isle of Man, its population and our our financial ability to pay it as well. And we felt that some of the decisions which have been taken by the UK in recent years had more to do with politics than sustainability. And bearing in mind that this is one of the biggest items of expenditure, £176 million a year, we were faced with the 
uh, prospect of having taxation but no representation as to how that money was spent. And there was a strong argument, uh, a strong lobby to say that we should merely follow the UK uh, because at that time the perception was that everybody would get the £155 basic state pension. Now that hasn't happened, certainly on the figures I've seen, um, less than half get the full state pension. Yeah. And the other thing which concerned m myself and Bill as well was that people who had thought that they were paying for an additional pension during their working lives wouldn't get that additional pension. So we felt that as structured it was difficult to justify and it wouldn't have been fair. What we have now, what we're working towards, is something which is easy to understand and it's easy to explain because now there's so many different components yeah. to how people's pensions are built up. Uh, it's hard for our staff to administer never mind the general public understanding it. Well, for a lot of people, pensions generally is, is a, it's a small word, but it's a big subject, isn't it? Because it, people get very confused when we're talking about public sector pensions liabilities, when we're talking about private uh, pension schemes, when we're talking about things like you're saying about AVCs and top-ups. And, I mean, there, there are a huge number of things that affect pension, but this, what we're talking about today is just the basic state pension. So in the past, uh, you just got your pension in the Isle of Man, whether you'd, you'd uh, contributed in the UK most of your life or not, as of April the 6th, whatever you paid in the UK is now liable from the UK. So is this going to be a, a, a lot of work for people to, to have to start chasing the UK uh, tax authorities to make sure that you get your pension? Well, the way it's going to work, Stu, is that um, we, we shall write out, that's the Department of uh, Social Security, to folk four months in advance or thereabouts of when they're due to start receiving their state pension. And this is for folk after the 5th, 6th of April yeah. this year. I must make that important point, Stu, because we've had a lot of calls from folk who are already in receipt of pensions now who have worked in the UK. If you're in receipt of pensions now, you are not affected. Right, because that'll be a worry for people. Yes, it is, and we've tried to make that point very clear on several occasions, but it's still concerning people, understandably. And just to make the point again, if you're in receipt of a pension now and have worked in the UK, you have no need to worry, no effect on you. And also, the other one too, if you've worked in the Isle of Man all your life, no effect on you. Sure. And some people are genuinely concerned, Stu. So, yeah. But anyhow, um, going forward with that, um, from the 5th of April, we'll be writing out to folk... About four months before. About four months due. before, yeah. yeah. And um, we'll advise them to make their claim as is standard anyway, if they're entitled to a UK pension, they'll be uh, advised there and to put their claim in and then there's a help number, contact details and so on on that letter made very, very clear and then we will write to them again following the claim where we'll give them a guesstimate of the Manx element, yeah. an idea of what they would have got on the old rules, if you like, with the two combined so they can get a rough idea of where they are and then... If somebody can demonstrate that they may be worse off because of the new rules, then we've also um, brought in a top-up system, which I put through Tinwell the other month, uh, whereby if you're any worse off and you can demonstrate it, we'll do a top-up system so nobody will be worse off. Right, OK. Which has been worrying people, and there's been a bit of misinformation put out as well on that, Stu, just to put people's minds at rest. And the other interesting factor that's coming out of the current calculations is that quite a few folk who have got split working records they may actually be slightly better off right okay uh, and i mean will will treasury here be sending out the forms the uk forms that people need to fill in to uh, send across to the uk to get the pension that, entitlement that, that person will have to contact the uk for that but right. we will help and there's help numbers on the on the correspondence we send out we've been working very very closely with the uk on right. this department of pensions and hmrc as well and i'd just like to give them a little plug here Stu, if i may because the work they've 
contributed to make all this happen for us has been incredible. They've actually bent over backwards in this case to go the extra mile and make everything good. match up and work and run for us. Good. Well, I mean, that's good news because a lot of people would be a bit nervous about it. You and I are doing paperwork day in, day out, so it, it's not a, a frightener to us. But a lot of people don't do that, you know, hate filling forms in and things. And especially if you if you seem to be uh, talking to some sort of an intransigent bureaucrat uh, and saying, you know, I need to claim this pension and, th and they give you the runaround. It's not going to be like that, you're saying, that well, you know, everybody's th on song with this. That, that's the plan, Stu. I can't give you a 100% guarantee on it, but I can give you a 99.9% .9 one on it. That's what we're aiming for. There's one single point of contact in the UK. And incidentally, in the very near future, a group of our social security officers will be going across to meet HMRC again and uh, Department of Work and Pensions as a round the table to debrief, if you like, yeah. to see if there are any emerging problems, what we can tweak and adjust, how can we make it better for people if there are any issues. So that's a really good way forward on that. So they are, and we are listening to people when they say, oh, I had this issue. Yeah, yeah, we can good. feed it in. Let's go to the lines we've got Rob on. Hello, Rob. Bit of background. I've been working on the Isle of Man now for getting up, oh, pushing on towards 30 years, I suppose, in a couple of years' time. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, right, um, in this new system, would I, as such, are the, are the, from now on, I'd be re expecting to receive a two-part pension. Um, would, would that, a um, couple of questions, really. Would, would, would I have any sort of supplement involvement with that, with a supplement? And um, also, is there any tax payable on that, that those, those pensions? And would, would, would it be a double tax, one to the UK and one here? Okay, interesting thought. Eddie Taylor. If I could take the tax question first and uh, ask Bill to deal with the other one. Uh, on the tax side, it's uh, you'd be taxed as taxable income on both the pension and the pension supplement. Now, in terms of the UK tax, there's a reciprocal agreement in place with the UK tax uh, department, and uh, that means that uh, you'd be paid gross from the UK, but there would be a tax liability in the Isle of Man. If you subsequently went to live in the UK, then your pension from the Isle of Man will be paid gross, but your pension, li your tax liability would then be in the UK. So Rob, Rob will only pay tax in the Isle of Man on w w whatever the source of his, uh, of his pension? He'll only pay tax once in effect. Yeah. yeah. So that answers right. that question. With regards to the Manx pension supplement, your Manx years worked here, if I can put it like that, uh, that will go towards a Manx pension supplement in the Isle of Man element of your pension based on uh, over a 30 year service period. Right, okay. And and is there a published scale when, when people's pensions are, are going to be applicable in terms of age, um, you know, and when they're, when they're paid? Because obviously there's a sliding scale going away from 65 now. It's the same as same as the UK, um, so it will start in, in, increasing. If you want specific guidance, you're very welcome to uh, contact the department, or if you like, send myself or Bill a an email, and we'll get an answer for you. Yeah. Um, it sounds to me as if it might be something which is customer specific. So we'd like to deal with it on a specific basis for you. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Does that answer your questions, Rob? Yeah, that's good. Thanks very much. Brilliant. You're welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's go to line one. We've got Ken on. Hello, Ken. Oh, good afternoon to you. Um, uh, I understand why we've changed, but an old hobby horse of mine is women's pensions. I haven't been told previously the last few years that we have to follow what the UK do. So when women got moved, in my wife's case, from 60 to 66 for old age pension, is this now a chance to get back and be a bit fairer to the women of the Isle of Man. Well, is it, a, um, is it being fairer to the women of the Isle of Man or has it been fairer to the men of the Isle of Man? Uh, because um, if you have a look at um, life expectancy, the ladies can expect to live for a decade or so longer than the gents. So um, it's a difficult argument to say that well, they I, should I be paid the pension that. earlier. people six years from 60 to 66. It was, a bit, it was a bit much. Yes, there was some movement. You know, previously, I think they had a, a, some committee in the UK, with Glenda Jackson led, because she was involved, and they, they cut it by a couple of years. So it wasn't 66, well, you know, it was from 60 to, say, 64, but to actually move, 
you know, I don't object to being moved from 65 to 66, but to actually move women. Now we're, we're the masters of our own destiny, after being told for years that we're not, because we follow the UK. I suppose the answer is, Ken, whether or not the politicians in the Isle of Man feel that that would be a sensible move to well, go back to that. That's correct, Stu. Well, if you go back to when the pensions were, were, were originally brought in, um, the male, ma males had to work until they were 70 to get a pension, and then for some reason it was reduced, even yeah. though people were living longer. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you for your call, Ken, and hopefully that's answered your question. Let's have a look at uh, some of our texts and emails. Uh, Stu, this is propaganda broadcasting for the aims of Messrs Tier and Henderson, which have no mandate from the voting public. What? Uh, no, it would be propaganda if we weren't inviting you to call in and make your point. Opposition groups are pressing for a public inquiry to take place immediately after the coming general election. OK. Um, Stu, can you confirm with the Treasury Minister and Bill Henderson that the new arrangements where someone who's worked in both jurisdictions claims a proportionate pension from the UK and from the Isle of Man won't affect the amount of man Manx supplement that they get? That's from Nick. The calculation on the Manx supplement... Uh, may change actually but in overall terms what we're planning to do if somebody can demonstrate that they'd be worse off under the new route under the new rules than they would have been on the old rules we've operate uh, what i was discussing earlier the top-up system so that in overall terms no one will be worse off but incidentally um, when we've been examining case-by-case uh, -case studies at uh, Markwell House, it's um, become apparent that actually there will be quite a few people who will be that little bit better off. So the fear factor that was there at the outset of this yeah. actually should diminish quite considerably. So I hope that's uh, a little bit of reassurance there. So, it, it, I mean, is that the, the answer then to, to anybody who's got a specific question? You can't, you can't look at everybody's individual cases on the radio, but uh, is there somebody that they can get in touch with at Treasury that can answer these questions? There are indeed, Stuart, um, on the letters. And the letters that we'll be sending out to people, of course, will have all the contact uh, details on. And certainly people can phone the pensions group um, part of the treasury and that's in the book or just the general government number will patch you through or six eight five oh nine six will get you through uh, through straight away and we make it very clear um on our stationery where the contact details yes. are and who you can ring so, so there's, there's so no problem or indeed again email bill.henderson at parliament.org.im yeah. and if there's anything specific there we haven't got to by all means I'll look into it for them but more to the point it's probably not something that's worth worrying about now because you, you say that whatever happens people aren't going to be any worse off under the new scheme than they were under yeah. the old one yeah and the other thing too is I want to make it clear that um, for somebody who's in their say 50s now, um, late 50s, early 60s, they're much better off waiting until yeah. the position is clearer. Yeah, because yeah. at the moment we're not able to give any firm guidance. And, and wait until you get this letter from Treasury four months beforehand to say, you know, you're coming up to pensionable age, this is what's going to happen, and, and take up the question at that point is probably best, isn't it? That's absolutely right, Stu. We'll send you the paperwork out, you fill it in, we'll send you a bit more out, and the contact details, uh, help numbers are all there. Uh, so uh, it should uh, be quite straightforward as far as that goes. Good. So the headline news I'm taking from this is that nobody's going to be worse off, we don't think. If anybody can prove that they're worse off, you've got a top-up scheme to deal with it. it. It's quite brave, this close to an election, to be messing about with pensions, isn't it, Eddie Tier? Um Well, we've got to do what is right rather than what's expedient. Well, this fair. is bringing... Th rather than messing, I think this is refocusing. It's not actually making a huge change to anybody, uh, such as we've seen the DLA row in the UK, Stu. Yeah, yeah. This is a technical exercise to keep providing the platform to pay people's pensions And from, to make it sustainable. And to make it sustainable going forward in the future. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Shortly, the Legislative Council will be asked to discuss and vote on legislation that would diminish their own power. Should they accept the Council of Ministers' Amendment Bill, which has gone through its readings and clauses stage in the House of Keys under Alfred Cannon, then Timwald as a whole will not take part in electing the next Chief Minister. It'll be up to the Keys alone. 
Martin Keyes will nominate a member and then 13 votes or more will elect him or her as Chief Minister. The bill has still to go to LegCo and then back to Keyes. Alfred Cannon, MHK, is pleased with the progress so far. Chief Minister Alan Bell has given the proposals a cautious welcome. So reform of the Manx parliamentary system does appear to be on the horizon. Do you think this is a positive step forward and the first towards reforming the Legislative Council or do you think it could lead to political instability and conflict between the two chambers and change should wait until full reform of the chamber is proposed. Patrick Corley doesn't agree with LegCo being sidelined. He firmly believes that both chambers are part of one parliament which represents the people, so he believes this is a wrong move. Simply doesn't agree with it. How about you? Get in touch and tell us. Ken Call, he said, uh, forget about reforming it, LegCo should be scrapped. He thinks that it's immoral that they're making decisions when they haven't been elected. OK, uh, another one. Mr Bell's claim of stability over the years is a joke and we're only a few years away from being unable to continue as an independent economic island. Clearly change is needed, which would include the House of Keys becoming the government of the island by taking the power from the Council of Ministers. There'd always be an executive, though, wouldn't there? There'd always be some sort of a cabinet, surely. Let's face it, LegCo is just part of the extended power base of the Chief Minister filled with compliant members or some MHKs who'd, been, who'd be very lucky to be re-elected, only have to look back recently to see three lawyers failing to garner any support for what would have been an excellent use of their skill set. That's from Skell in Port St Mary. Stu, so once again, Alan Bell plays the political stability card. A second chamber is an asset to good democracy, at least in theory, although many jurisdictions have dumped their upper chamber. But can Mr Bell please give us some worthwhile examples where the wonderful Legislative Council has demonstrated its worth to advise, revise and scrutinise? LegCo appears to currently exist simply to support and do the dirty work for the Council of Ministers, reciprocating the well-paid supporters of Mr Bell. In its current form and fully and full of largely ineffective former MHKs, it needs to be scrapped and rebuilt from the ground up, says Albert. Strong words. And final comment. Stu, I'm surprised that the proposed legislation doesn't cover the office of President of Timwald. Another job for life without being elected by the public at large, says Chris. All right then. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets. With the only Khan Dean design showroom on the island. You're listening to the latest Talking Heads podcast, featuring highlights from the programme over the past week. The Nation Station, Manx Ray. We heard last week plans to refurbish Douglas Promenade have hit a setback to discuss the situation and just what's going to happen next. We're joined in the studio by beleaguered Minister for the Department of Infrastructure, Phil Gorn. Good afternoon, Minister, and thanks very much for joining us today. I realise that you've got an awful lot of things on your plate at the moment. Yeah, first of all, you. Yes, it's it's a very um, interesting time to be Infrastructure Minister, certainly. Well, I'm trying to remember the chronology. It seems to be one of those stories that's gone on and gone round the houses so many times now. I'm getting a bit confused by it. But uh, you, you had people that came in and came up with a, a fantastic new scheme, a new new vision for Douglas Promenade that was much more than just fixing the fact that the road's broken. It was a case of you were going to revitalise the whole thing, you were going to move the horse trams, this, that and the other. Um, and then you got a, an independent planning co- uh, uh, inspector to come over and he said uh, no. So, you know, all the experts have come up with this great new scheme and then the independent fellas come along and said no to it. I mean, it, it, could you not have just ignored him? Because that seems to be what happens if uh, if other people come up with objections that you disagree with. Well, you accused me of spin before. I'll accuse you of the same. That's an interesting uh, spin that you've put on that. Um, We had one uh, person who was very interested in in quite an ingenious uh, and certainly innovative uh, uh, new highways design process who we did uh, bring over to talk to us about his ideas. And he was available to promote some ideas. But our engineers designed the scheme uh you know it wasn't some expert from across coming and right. telling us how to do it um the, the problem with a scheme like the promenade scheme and i i, I may still hope to be the minister that will be that will get some sort of permission and, and something moving on this um but i i i, I'm, I can't be <laughs> i can't be confident on that uh the way things go there are so many interested parties with different competing interests uh i really do fail to see how we're going to satisfy everybody um, you know, obviously, I'm disappointed that the scheme didn't uh, go through. Uh, but that said, again, the the, the, pr- the primary reason the scheme didn't go through was uh, one set of experts didn't agree with another set of experts on whether having a horse tram uh, travelling along the side of a walkway was safe or not. Um, our experts, uh, who actually operate horse trams and op- operate vintage uh, railways, uh, apparently 
aren't as, as clever as the other experts because the other experts seem to persuade the inspector uh, to go in, in that particular way. Well, now, is, I've been is... accused of being arrogant by stating that. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to be, and I've got no, no wish to, to uh, undermine people or upset anybody. Uh, I'm just stating the facts as I see them. We had our experts. They claimed that the, the, the scheme was safe. It was the best possible compromise we could reach with all the different parties, you know, even the the uh, friends of, uh, what are they called? I can't remember now, the keep cars and horses off the walkway. We did our best to work with them to try and accommodate some of their views. We moved the track as a result of some of the conversations we'd had with them. So um, you know, we, we'd done as much as we possibly could, we felt, to de- design a scheme which fit, meted, or, or met everybody's uh, needs. But it's not going to be possible to do that. And whatever new version of a scheme we come forward with, someone's going to complain about it. In fact, I already know one MHK has questioned down to me about the new plans that we're proposing to submit because he doesn't like that we've dropped the horse trams out of a particular element of it. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, if it's a case of... Uh, and it seems to hinge on the fact that the proposed location for the horse trams wasn't going to be safe. Isn't that a simple health and safety issue? I mean, we've got health and safety inspectors on the Isle of Man. Did, did they not say that this is unsafe and you shouldn't proceed with it? The advice that I was given by all my senior officers was that the scheme as designed was a safe scheme to go ahead with. Now, the inspector disagrees with that uh, because the advice that he's been given, he was given two sets of conflicting advice, obviously, and the conflicting advice he's gone with, uh, or or, sorry, the piece of advice he's gone with is the one that conflicts with the department's position. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't really know what more I could do or say uh, the in, in relation to this, the officers who said what they said said it because they believed it, not because they were trying to make things up. Um, you know, they, it was that was the evidence that, that they presented and they genuinely believed that it was going to be safe. Conspiracy theorists would suggest that this was maybe manna from heaven for you, that the independent planning inspector said, no, no, you shouldn't be spending £21 million on this because it won't work, it's not safe. Uh, at the same time that you were maybe under pressure from council and ministers uh, to save some money. You know, £21 million was always a fairly ambitious scheme financially. So did this just give you a, a good and a easy get-out? Well, it was just under two years ago when uh, the Chief Minister approached me to ask whether I would take on the job of uh, Infrastructure Minister and I said to him at that time um, my biggest concern is that a £21 million scheme for the Douglas uh, Promenade is going to be an incredibly difficult sell to the public and we'll need all the support we can get <laughs> to, to get that through. I'm not absolutely confident that I've had all the support <laughs> <laughs> that I can get on this. However, um, you know, I, I I do get that. I do understand. And I also, you know, I, I fully understand the people who've been campaigning against the horse trams going on, on the walkway. You know, I, I do understand that. I very much sympathise. I very much sympathise with the people who say, well, let's get rid of the parking and just allow the, the, the trams to, to, to run where the, the cars would have been parked. From my personal political perspective, that ticks all the boxes. But I know that from the Chamber of Commerce's point of view, from uh, Douglas Borough Council's point of view, from a range of, of other uh, representative bodies' point of view, they want to see as much parking as they can possibly get on the promenade. So is this part of the problem that there are just too many stakeholders, which is the current term for anybody who's interested in this, uh, there are too many stakeholders who've got you know concerns uh, and none of them are compatible, really? And, and the whole thing seems to hinge on the horse trams. Uh, was it earlier this year that it was announced that Douglas Corp weren't going to run them anymore? So that seemed to be a, a very neat solution. If you don't have to worry about horse trams at all, then that made the promenade scheme so much easier, didn't it? Yes, and of course it would be a neat solution if it wasn't for the fact that our horse trams are unique in the world. Um, I certainly got elected on a ticket uh, which had very, very clearly printed on it in big, bold letters... I believe that we should be doing everything we can to look after the heritage and culture of the Isle of Man, to uh, promote it and to develop it and be proud of where we come from and and, and the the things that are unique about the island. Um, So from my personal perspective, I think it's absolutely crazy to think that we would get rid of the horse trams. That said, as a minister, you are responsible for pulling together a whole range of different and conflicting opinions and uh, certainly there is a strong view in government that uh, now is the time for the the horse trams to go. Um, 
And again, that's an, uh, yet another element of, of this in- incredibly confused and difficult uh, scheme. And uh, as I say, we will continue, certainly as long as I'm, I'm Infrastructure Minister, I, I will continue to try and find a solution which uh, meets everybody's needs. Uh, I know I'm going to upset some people along the way, um, but I'm, I'm not doing this willfully and deliberately to try and upset people. I'm doing it because I'm trying to find a scheme that's going to work. I suppose this is the problem with democracy, really, and that everybody's got a say in this. And, and quite often people who have an interest in things like the horse tram have got a very loud voice. Uh, and, and it might just, you know, stifle the, the entire promenade redevelopment because because people are so het up about the horse tram. Yeah, it could. And of course, we we have ran several consultations. In fact, we even ran a, an information uh, exercise which demonstrated what it was we're actually going to do. And because a lot of people said, well, why can't we give you any feedback, even though effectively this was the feedback <laughs> session, uh, basically saying this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've now... Um, done all the consultation we're ever going to do uh, so at that point someone said well why can't we give you feedback on on your feedback yes uh, so we said yeah okay you can do that but on every occasion it's kind of been about a 50 50 split in terms of who who likes which elements yeah. so the public aren't giving us a helpful bit of guidance that says absolutely this is the way you should do uh, the, the scheme. So it's it is it's it's very difficult. It's a very complicated scheme. There's a huge amount of research and hard work gone into trying to uh, work with everybody to try and, uh, and accommodate everyone's views. Um, the, the top and the bottom of it is, if we want to have everything that everyone wants, we probably need to extend by uh, fifty uh, yards into the sea, uh, the whole of the of the promenade to, to to fit everything in. All right. When we talked about this probably six months ago, I think you said at the time, and this was probably the the time of the consultation or or the exhibition that you did, that there were two options really. One of them was you do the job properly, you spend twenty one million pounds, and you, you because there are it's not just a case of plane and resurface the the foundation of the prom work were, were uh, goosed as well needed a lot of work doing so there were two options you could either do the job properly or you could do a sort of a, a cover-up job you could just resurface the promenade now and it would cost i can't remember was it two million quid or half a million quid or whatever uh, and that would maybe last you for five years but it would need redoing at some point so all you're doing is delaying the inevitable yeah you can replace like for like uh, for about 15 million pounds um, and that would be without a tram track um so if you wanted to include the tram track on a like-for-like like basis, that would be in the region of £18 million. Um, the problem we have, though, with relocating the tram track back in exactly the same spot it is, is because it's going to have to be lifted. Um, if you then go to put it back, uh, effectively you're putting a heritage railway sm- slap bang in the middle of a busy highway, yeah. and we are pretty sure that you know if we thought it was unsafe to run a horse tram at the side. Along the side on, 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 on the, of the walkway, it's certainly not going to be safe to have it in the middle of a busy highway. So uh, we were pretty confident that we wouldn't get uh, permission to continue to use the, the existing location. Once you've t- lifted it up, of course, yes. you are removing something that w- has been there for 140 years. So you go to put it back down again and you have to then comply with modern day standards. Oh, right. So, so this is part of the problem I think we had with that. So we could, as I say, replace replace like for like for around about 18 million quid but uh, i thought we, it was much less than that no just... no no uh, if you wanted to do plain and overlay yeah which would be you know that's something that i think uh, if i did that and somebody found out that i'd done that that's that really is a resignation issue because it is a gross misuse of public funds to, to plane and overlay a structure that you know is going to you know the the, right. the, the tarmac's just going to disintegrate fairly quickly because the problem is with the foundations moving uh you're always going to get cracking in it you are largely going to be wasting millions and millions of taxpayers money by not fixing the the whole problem so let's take that off the table there is no cheap fix to this whatever you do there's no cheap yeah, fix che- to cheapest it. is is 15 million that's replacing just replacing the road uh getting all the the drains, the uh, electrics, the uh, phones, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I assume there's gas, the sewerage, all that. All all that infrastructure needs to be replaced. So not much cheaper then than the Rolls Royce scheme, effectively. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. And and of course the Rolls Royce scheme, if if you want to really go into Rolls Royces, would have been nearer to twenty eight or thirty million pounds. Right. Uh, we 
pegged it back quite significantly because 21 million was the figure that had been agreed. Uh, when, the, when the Rolls-Royce scheme had been designed, it was at least uh, 25, 26 million, and there were a whole load of things that had been dropped from that. Right. Uh, so, you know, if you really want to, to, to push the boat out, we could spend an awful lot more. Uh, but 15 million is a figure that you could effectively replace like for like and what's the current plan then so so we're not going to do the 21 million pound scheme it's going to cost 15 million pounds to to replace like for like is that what we do and effectively are people just going to see a new road surface and a new tram track well having spent in the region of half a million pounds on the design having gone through the trouble of consulting with practically everybody under the sun who has any interest in uh, the the promenade um it does seem a bit unfortunate to, to then just rip up all that design and all those plans, particularly bearing in mind it was only a relatively small element that the inspector uh, commented against, uh, and that was the safety of the trams on the on the walkway. So we can actually, and, and I think the, the proposal is that uh, we're going to resubmit plans for um, the road work um, associated with the, the scheme as fa- from the sea terminal through to the war memorial, we can get that hopefully uh, agreed by planning. There wasn't very much, if any, uh, objection to that. Uh, and then uh, we can look from the war memorial through to Summerland and then try and work out how we're going to fit uh, a tram track in or indeed whether we're going to try and fit a tram track in. So uh, the the bit from the sea terminal then down to this afternoon, the war memorial, where is the tram track going to be in that scheme? There's no tram track in that uh, that bit. Um, we always felt that it was reasonable to have a track as far as the war memorial, possibly with uh, the electric uh, tram uh, being able to, to, to run along there as well. Um, we didn't feel that it was necessary to go from the war memorial through to the sea terminal, but uh, the uh, Douglas Borough Council were very insistent that they felt it should. And as Douglas at that time were uh, responsible the as, as the operator, um, and uh, th- there were all kinds of legal reasons why uh, you know, it was going to be really difficult if we couldn't reach agreement with Douglas, uh, we decided, OK, we'll design it to go right through to the sea terminal. Now that Douglas have pulled out, um, we f- effectively are saying, if we're going to have a tram track, uh, we don't think it needs to go any further than the War Memorial. Right, OK, OK, that's interesting. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Report on the state of public sector pensions and proposed reforms is due to go before Timwell next month. Well, this month now. It's been put together by the island's Public Sector Pensions Authority. A number of options for tackling the legacy funding gap, the difference between what's being paid in by members today and the cost of paying the pensions due to retired, and the future cost of paying accrued benefits to those still working have been explored. But many of the options have been ruled out for the time being because they either won't create sustainability or could leave the government open to legal challenge. But the report proposals to create, uh, proposes to create a sustainable scheme in the long term and manage the shortfall in funding in the interim. These proposals would see scheme members pay an extra 2.5% into their pensions and expect less back when they retire. The proposals for reforms to the Government Unified Scheme have been accepted by most of the unions, including Unite. And we're joined in the studio now by Unite's Island Man Regional Officer Eric Holmes. Good afternoon, Eric, and thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon, Stu, and thanks for the invitation. Not at all. This is, uh, I mean, you, you're one of the main unions as far as public sector workers are concerned, so this is obviously going to have an impact, impact on your members. And I know that Unite the Union has been working sort of behind the scenes in many ways, looking at all these uh, problems and, and, and trying to come up with your own solutions, haven't you? Well, yes, it's not just Unite. I mean, Unite, as you say, is, is the largest union on the Isle of Man in the UK. We currently have 1,800 active members paying into the scheme. Uh, and on top of that, we've got people who are already in receipt of benefits. Something had to be done. Um, obviously, the, the report that had been commissioned by uh, Minister Chris Robertshaw at the time had to be challenged to see whether or not it was actually factually correct. Yeah. Uh, and all the unions met uh, en masse to form a, a work group as such that could be then set down as a, as a subcommittee to meet with the employer side to go through negotiations. They used that um, to then form what is known as a TAG group, a technical advisory group, yeah. as was used in the UK. Yeah. Now, luckily, we've got Brian Freak uh, as our pensions officer, who has vast experience and is well-recognised in the UK. 
He was joined by prospects uh, Neil Walsh, again a, another guy that's actually a, an actuar actuarial, um, myself and the BMA uh, were quite happy not to, to bother attending the tag team because they knew the input there was sufficient and yeah. as such they'd run along with it. But it moved along and we were trying to find a solution that was fair and sustainable. Uh, following the report and first actuarial's recommendation that yes the figures were in fact correct and something had to be done right now so well that, that's an important point so that's the first point then so the union yes. recognizes that something had to be done yes uh, it, it was no use just standing there arguing about who's to blame we we all know who's to blame and and i'll be straight with you as far as i'm concerned the government was to blame back in the early days when we were actually discussing gus uh, and, and its implementation we, I personally wrote to the Minister of the Day, uh, uh, Mr Brown, and stated to him, were Hyman's Robinson actually working with the correct set of figures for uh, drawdown from membership, right. uh, just natural wastage, i.e. 8%. Uh, and he said, yes. And I said, but you're using accelerated wastage at the moment. We're actually losing more than the 8%. Has that been factored into account? And he said, no. Now, other unions also raised similar sort of objections that were sort of saying, well, we're not 100% sure that it will work. Right. But Hyman's Robinson are looking at the figures and they're sort of saying, and the government's saying, yes, it should work. There was uh, a drawdown date of 2020 when any changes were likely to have happened, should happen. Uh, and obviously there'd be actuarial reviews during that period to see whether we were online. But due to the mass exodus from governments and the public service as such through Mars and VRS schemes, far greater than normal wastage, uh, obviously we found ourselves in a position where the contributions were not sufficient at that yeah. stage. Yeah. So rather than stand there arguing a point, someone has to take control. And obviously uh, I was then elected by all the other trade unions sat around that table to chair or oh, to vice chair that's the subcommittee which is what i've done i also sat on tag because i can provide local experience to the tag members who are all based in london all right let's go to the lines we've got ken on who's got a question i think hello ken what's the main difference between prospect an ex-prospect member and unite what why is unite say yes we're prospect to say no and the other thing is how does it affect people like teachers and the judiciary which hardly pay anything at the moment oh, well good questions they're, they're actually outside the scheme at the moment ken um difference between unite and prospect historically unite are the workforce uh, trade union uh, and as such our vast majority of membership was based upon manual workers prospect were part of goa uh, and as such were the government's association and the civil service side it's two separate sides the working, working man side paid the 5% from 72 onwards. The civil service side paid 1.5%. Obviously, once the GUS scheme was put into fruition, uh, their, their, their payments increased, their contributions have increased. And by 2017, they will be paying the full amount. Does that right. answer your questions? No, it doesn't. Why, why is Unite in favour of it? What's the name? Why is Unite saying yes? Was Prospect to say no? Or doesn't it, you can't speak to a Prospect? Bear in mind you're all in this tag. So you're, you yes. basically you're talking about tag, which sort of implies that the whole tag committee were in favour of the new proposals. It's not, no, no, no. It, it, it's not just tag. Tag were in favour of the proposals. And that, that fed in to the fuller subcommittee and all the trade unions involved in that fuller subcommittee and there are approximately around about 10 trade unions involved in total uh, and all but Prospect and the POA uh, were in a position to say yes this has legs and it needs to be moved forward. We, this isn't a done and signed deal yet this has now gone from Coleman to Tinwell for their approval but as far as I'm concerned taking advice from our pensions advisor and prospects pensions advisor yes this has the potential to move forward uh, and and do what it's meant to do and just be sustainable there you go ken thank you very much for your call i hope that's answered your questions i've got uh, a good few texts who've just come in so let's uh, make a start on them uh, government need to stop allowing a partner of a public sector worker from claiming the state marriage pension when the partner is getting a public sector full pension 
I don't know whether or not you've got a point of view on that. I'm not quite sure I understand the, the question, to be honest. No, I think I'd have to sit down with it in right in the head of me to try and work out oh. what's, here, what's, what's behind it. Why should public sector workers claim two pensions out of the same part, state pension and public pension, says Pat? Well, well, one they pay for separately and the you, other one's you, part of the NI contributions. You, you pay for both of them. Yeah, so you pay you should, for both, so yeah, it's yeah. a contract. Uh, this deal is not fair and is not sustainable. John Shimmy said last week that in 40 years' time the public sector pensions should be sustainable. However, in 40 years' time, Mr Shimmy and his cronies in government and senior civil servants will have made the island bankrupt with their greed. Our children and our children's children will be paying for their greed. Nobody on a public sector pension should be allowed to claim one penny until they've reached the age that the old age pension is given to the general public. That from Bert in Port St Mary. I think that a, a few people are, are uh, irritated by the, the see, uh, stories of people retiring at 55 yes. or whatever with a lump sum and a pension. And, uh, you know, on the basis that the working population is getting older, it, it's like, well, hang on a minute, we're expected to work till 67 or, or longer now. Yeah. And people are retiring at 55 with a big chunk. But I think that the, the lump sum is limited if you take it early, isn't it? And well, the, the, the pension itself is, is limited. Yeah, the idea of the lump sum, the commutation rate of 18 to 1 was to end encourage people to cash in more of their pension to reduce the liability yeah. of an actual payout pension. So, okay. Can you ask Eric why the union prospect don't support the proposals? Well, I think we've just covered that with Ken's call. Uh, I don't think anybody minds the public sector getting a nice pension. What winds me up is what they receive is substan substantially more than they contribute. Also, promotion in the final few years of employment gives them an even higher payout. I've heard this before. I personally know public sector workers in the fire service and police who've retired with a pot of 300,000 plus I up staff taking substantially more. There's no way that they've paid anything near that in. We, the taxpayer, are paying for these servants to have a very comfortable early retirement when we have to work to 65 to have a basic state pension. We have to make our own investments if we want to have an extra pension, and this is taxed unfairly too, says Jimmy. A few Again, points there. Yeah, no, I, and I can understand the anger because of the, the mischief uh, and the confusion that has been actually led politically in certain factors. To, to create this confusion. People have paid towards their pension. We have members who have paid anything from 5% up to 11% in the case of firefighters. They've paid that for a long, long time. And that was done specifically in the yikes of the firefighters because of the so fact they that could they could early. retire early yes. because they're physically wrecked and they're not capable. Yeah. Uh, and as such, they paid a lot of money for that. I now work for Unite and I pay 11% for my, uh, my pension. It's an acceptable sort of thing moving forward. Uh, and I can't see any other sort of way of doing it uh, because, as I say, you are making contributions. The difference in the contributions for a long time were out of kilter. They've now moved back in by 2017. As I say, everyone will be paying the same amount. Then, if this is accepted, the transitional arrangements come in. 1%, 1%, half a percent. Another comment, the easy solution to the public sector pension moaners, give them all back what they've paid in and force them to invest in a private pension like the rest of us. Then watch the smiles wiped off their faces. Now, I mean, that that's typical of a lot of comments that I've had. And I think that they're unfair. Yes. Because, you know, if I'd have, have uh, gone for a government job 30 years ago and they said, all right, we'll give you a tenner a week or whatever it was 30 years ago, uh, which is maybe less than you get in the private sector, but there are good perks... And uh, one of those good perks is that you get a good pension out of it. Then you join that and you mm -hmm. work your way up through the system for 30 years. And then for somebody to say, oh, you shouldn't, you know, you should be thrown out of it and just giving back the money that you've paid in. I, I don't think that that's helpful. Personally. No, it, it doesn't help at all. I mean, there's a contractual obligation on both parts. Both parties were quite satisfied with it. Unfortunately, government found itself in a position where it was difficult to, to, to fund a liability. Yeah. This, the, the proposal that's been put forward was never going to fill that liability short term. But as I say, long term, yes, there will be money to backfeed that sector. Yeah, good. Uh, Stu, the way I read it is that the government scheme will require significant subsidisation by the private sector based on a guesswork economic growth forecast. How can this be fair or moral when we have to work into our 70s or until we drop yet another exercise in root cause avoidance by the unions and the government, says Neil. Well, I'm sorry that they feel that way, but... Is it right that people who benefit from the scheme make the decisions on it? This should be put into private company to administer. There's a thought. I mean, this is the old argument about Turkey's voting for Christmas. Uh, you know, is this something that realistically ought to be taken out of the hands of, of government completely, and, and the unions to an extent, where a completely independent body comes along and says, right, this is these are the numbers, they're indisputable, this is what you're going to have to do? That, that's what's been done. 
it, as far as has been done as such, and, right. and the unions in, as a whole or in general uh, accepted that yes, okay, there does need to be change. Yes, it's uh, it's ahead of when it was scheduled, but if change is needed and it, it creates a position where this pension scheme is sustainable, yeah. then why would you want to destroy it? Make all public sector workers work until state pension age before claiming public sector pension to get more contributions in, says Pat. I suspect that probably most of them do, don't they? Most people do work until state retirement age. And yes, yes. In, in fact, they do. Uh, and people who did retire early or people who left on Mars schemes and VRS schemes uh, are basically back out working again. The number of people that I know who did retire early who are now back working because the pension that they're receiving is not, as you sort of say, this fat cat pension. Yeah. They still have to work to supplement. Well, that getting. causes a lot of anger amongst people as well, and I have to say that that's something that I just don't see, in that people seem to be aggrieved if somebody takes early retirement and then gets another job. Uh, you know, to me, you, you've got two choices when you retire. You either garden for the rest of your life or do whatever, or if you want to work, then, you know, why shouldn't you be paid to work again if you want to carry on working? Yeah. Well, again, it comes down to personal choice, doesn't it? A lot of people had this ideology, yes, I can't wait, I'm going to retire at 55. Yeah. Uh, and then after a year or two, they suddenly start thinking, well, I'm a bit bored now, and start kicking a can around the street. Let's get back to, <laughs> to work uh, and put them back into society. I'd love so, to retire early. It's never going to happen, I'm afraid. But it's not. Well, I had the options, and I chose the other option, actually. I chose to name me colours to the mass for another 10 years. Right. So, oh, well. yes, I was a, a government employee at one sort of stage. I've got a deferred pension. Right. I'm paying 11% into a, into a fresh pension. But all right, another one. All public sector pension recipients should have a cut in their pension, like all private people that may have saved 5 to 10% of their wages and only receive a few hundred pounds a year due to low interest rates, whereas they'll have expected a few thousand pounds a year interest, so need to pass a law that public sector employees will be prevented from making a legal challenge on any reduction. It's a thought. Uh, do the maths, you'd have to pay half of your wages to make this sustainable. Well, apparently not. No. No, and, and the increases, although people are saying 2.5% is not a lot of money, 2.5% on current contributions is a 35% hike. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a lot of money to, to for people to find. But yes, um, it's still, at this stage, it's a proposal. Yeah. Uh, Robin Peel called, does your guest think that index-linked pensions should be scrapped? I think it creates a big problem with funding when it comes to paying out pensions. I think index-linked pensions should be scrapped altogether. Uh, where does Eric stand on this? Well, I'm fighting to save a final benefit salary scheme. Right. Uh, can all the people slagging off public sector pensions join their own pension scheme or save your money towards retirement as we do? Uh, it's a point. Uh, what happened to the bus driver's contract terms and conditions? Government scrapped them for fun. Well, I don't think it was for fun. A lot of lessons were learned from that, uh, and it's taken a long time to try and find some sort of stability. But that is the potential that you risk from the public sector as a whole. And I don't think a lot of people realise just how big the public sector is, work span wise. Yeah. Uh, are MHAs going to be included as well as the workers, says Steve? Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, I think that they're actually going to pay substantially they've already, more. They've already agreed that as of this year, they will pay, well, as of the election September, they will pay straightforward 10%. Yeah, OK. Uh, pensions. People are so blinkered by moaning about civil service pensions that they fail to notice that a number of people are actually losing out on the state pension. Yes. I was born in 1954, 61-year-old female, so missed retirement at 60, but the age was to be staggered. Originally, retirement was 64. Next, my retirement age was bumped up to 65, so I lost out on another year, which I accepted. Now, I realise that the bump to 66 happens in 2018, so I lose yet another year. This is totally unfair, as I can't help the year I was born, and the raising of pension age should be moved so that nobody loses out three times, or we should be compensated. We all have to accept changes, but it shouldn't mean that, this, uh, that some people are penalised more than others. Yeah, it's an interesting comment, and, and that comment was actually made yesterday, uh, and it struck home with me as well. It's something that needs need to be sort of looked into. Um, whether or not we can find a solution to it or not, I don't know, because it's similar like what uh, year your child was born in and whether they get into a school or whether they miss a year. Mm -hmm. So there will always be cut-off dates. Uh, but whether or not, as, as, as the uh, listeners sort of stated, to be hit three or four times uh, through age changes uh, is, not, is not right. All right. Uh, would Eric support others paying the same percentage as police and fire service? Well, they 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 are currently paying up to the eleven percent. They will they will 
if accepted, go to 13.5%. I currently pay 11 for my own personal pension. Yeah. So if that's but, what but they pay more because they usually they pay retire more sooner. because of the benefit and the fact is it was built in and again within uh, the mental health uh, nursing side there were another group that uh, had the options to retire early but they paid a higher percentage to cover that. All right, we're completely over time, but uh, Eric Holmes, thanks very much indeed for coming in today. It's been fascinating talking to you. OK, thank you. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Khan Dean design showroom on the island. That's it for the latest look back at Talking Heads. Our thanks as ever to everyone who took part in the programme. If you'd like to get involved in the discussion, you can call, text or email between midday and 2pm on weekdays, or share your thoughts on the Facebook page at any time. That's Talking Heads with Stu Peters. You can listen back to each day's programme in full using the on-demand section of manxradio.com and the website's also where you'll get a daily update of what we're discussing on the programme. You can also keep up to date with that information by liking the Facebook page or following Stu Manx on Twitter. And if there's anything you think we should be discussing on the programme, why not tell us by emailing talk at manxradio.com. But that's it for now, so until next time, goodbye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click Shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.